So like the video, share it, um, and yeah, we're gonna get started. Um, la my last video, I talked about spiritual gifts. Um, briefly, I just laid a foundation for the rest of it. Um, next, we're gonna be talking about the gifts and how they operate in the church. Who has spiritual gifts? Where do, how do people get spiritual gifts? What people like? What spiritual gifts people get? Um, how does this work? And that's what I'm gonna be talking about uh, next video. Um, but with this video, I'm gonna be talking about how to grow and activate the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Um, so before we get started, we have to actually realize that these are two different things and they operate in different areas. Um, but spiritual gifts are one thing and spiritual fruit are one thing or another thing. Sorry. Um, so we see in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, um, where it talks about the fruit of the spirit. And this is what it says. And we'll get into all of this um, after I read this. So it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such, there is no such law. So it lists nine things um, about the fruits of the Spirit. And what's something interesting. So um, in John, it represents the Holy Spirit as a dove. And so that I don't know if you know this, but a dove has nine main left wings, nine main right wings, and five back wings, main back wings. Um, so the left wings represent the fruit of the Spirit. The nine um, on the right side represent... Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the back five represent the ministry gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in Ephesians 4, I believe. Um, so it, it lists these spiritual, um, the spiritual fruit. Um, it says, so I believe that we can, also, we can often lose, um, just focus on what these spiritual gifts are. Because um, God wants us to have spiritual fruit. And um, I, I believe that we've often fail to make a difference between or realize the difference between the spiritual fruit and the spiritual gifts. Um, do you think, so in my last video, I used an example um, of a Christmas tree to represent spiritual gifts. Um, and I said, they're just like presents under a Christmas tree. They're, they don't take long to put under and they don't take long to open as well. Um, so using the exact same example, we can um, apply this to the spiritual gifts and the spiritual fruit. So spiritual fruit or well, starting with spiritual gifts is like an ornament on a Christmas tree. You can put it on um, a tree and it doesn't take long at all. Um, and then you can take it off and it's only on there for certain seasons, especially for Christmas. But um, you can't put an ornament or attach an ornament to a real apple tree. And so an apple tree um, grows actual fruit. It grows on the tree, but an ornament doesn't actually grow on the tree. Um, but an apple takes a while to grow. It actually takes often sometimes years to grow an actual like a perfect apple, like two to three years. I mean, it takes a long time. And so with spiritual fruit, I believe that um, most Christians believe that it, it can just grow overnight. Um, but the reality is, is that um, to grow an apple tree, it takes a lot of careful um, just practicing, mastering. Um, it takes a lot of labor to just take care of plants. Um, they need a lot of water. They need a lot of sunlight. They need these certain things. They need to be carefully taken care of. And ju that's just like spiritual fruit. And that's why it's compared to the fruit at, like, at all. Um, it, would expect, it would be absurd to expect spiritual fruit to grow overnight. And um, this is something that I actually expect to happen or expected to happen at the beginning of my walk. But I'm now realizing that it's a lot more. Um, God bless you too, my friend. It takes a lot more than just. Um, just turning your life to Christ in order like that's when the seed is planted but we actually have to, have to also grow that fruit um, and it says in 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 2 6 praise the Lord thank you Lord it says the hardship a hard working farmer must first partake of the crops so you have to be a hardworking farmer. Fruit does not come forth without labor. It's, it's, you can't get fruit without working hard. You can't grow fruit without planting seeds and then making sure that they're actually growing right. We act like spiritual fruit grow overnight when in fact this is not the case. Um, fruit can grow on its own, but in the world market study, you cannot possibly find any plants or not any plants, but any fruit that actually grows by itself and that anybody wants. Um, well, you just can't find any fruit that's just simply, they market it as something that just grows by itself. 
Um, all fruit requires very careful and often intensive cultivation that involves time and care. Sim similarity, no one will bring spiritual fruit to perfection who does not cultivate it. We should also realize that a gift of the spirit will not be as effective unless the fruit of the spirit is cultivated alongside of it. So if you don't grow your spiritual gifts where, which, with your spiritual fruit, they're not going to be as effective. And so my recommendation is that we actually grow them at the same time. So if you're learning, if you have the spiritual gift of prophecy and you're learning how to be patient, you should also like, you should learn how to do those things at the same time. And this is very important for growing actually good fruit. Um, ex ex so yesterday I talked about how um, receiving a gift from the Holy Spirit will not, not actually change your character, but working in it exercising in the spiritual gift might actually change your character. It might give you more faith. It might give you more determination um, to actually just keep serving God. You're seeing miracles. You're seeing these things. Um, and you're actually helping people. And you actually love um, blessing people with these spiritual gifts that God has given you. Um, but it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2, it says, um, and I'm going to read this. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have no love, but I have not love, sorry, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and this word mountains here means difficult circumstances, um, but have not love, I am nothing. So you can have all these spiritual gifts, but it's not actually going to help you. It's not actually going to benefit you. It might benefit somebody else. You might actually heal somebody and they actually get benefited, but like, it's not going to change who you are. They're not going to be doing out of love, so it's not going to edify you. It's just going to edify the other person, which is not actually um, a terrible thing. But like we want to do it out of love. And these spiritual gifts actually work best um, when you're actually feeling compassion and love for others. We can see oftentimes in the Gospels that Jesus actually, when he healed somebody, he off, well, every time he felt compassion for them. And in this, a miracle actually happened. And we see that almost every time in the Bible when there's some kind of miracle, it's always out of love. So in order to continue to just thrive in these spiritual gifts, we actually have to have love or you're nothing. That's what Paul says. Um, so having all the spiritual gifts means nothing. It's, it's a gift. It's something that you've received from the Holy Spirit. It's not of yourself. What do you have that you did not receive, Paul says. Um, this is interesting because even though they did not benefit you, um, because the absence of love, they may benefit others. If I have the gift of healing and exercise it without love, it does not profit me anything, but it may profit the other person. Um, so an example is that one time I got a message from the Lord and I was telling, I was asked to, um, tell somebody to continue to practice something, um, but doing, uh, it at a more extent, um, rate, not extent rate, but just at a more, a higher rate. I'm just reading the Bible more. And when I went to go speak to this person, I came with aggressive tone because my objective was not to obey God or to show lo love to this person, but it was to be like, you're messing up, dude. And so I didn't do it out of love. And what happened was, is that this person didn't actually take this message very well. And it didn't actually edify either of us. And we didn't, it wasn't, it didn't accomplish really anything. Um, so when we like do things for God, we have to make sure that our, our motive is right. That's why um, David says, create me a clean heart, O God. That's why in James, it says that you may purify your hearts. It says in James 4, 8, it says, purify, purify your hearts, you sinners. We, ha we have to ha walk with a pure heart. We have to obey with a pure heart. And we have to do it out of love. So that not only edifies the other person, but edifies ourselves as well. The one who exercises the gift does not actually profit from it unless it is expressed in love. But God is good to those who need healing even when we are hard-hearted. Um, that's why in Ezekiel eleven nineteen it says that he will take their heart of stone and turn it to flesh. Um, and then he will put a new spirit within them and that they may walk in his judgments and keep his statutes. Um, um, and so this is a question um, that I have not personally been asked, but this is a question that I've seen um, a lot of other places. So if so, if you have spiritual fruit, do you need spiritual gifts? And this is my answer. You need both. You need all of them. You need ministry gifts. You need spiritual gifts. You need all of them. They all work together. And so like we have to we have to imagine that we're actually operating in the church and we're actually operating in power. That's why in um 2 Timothy 3 it says that they may have a they they will have a form of godliness but deny the power that actually can make them like God. And so Jesus had the like he had all of these gifts. I mean, he was literally God in incarnate, like in the flesh. Um and so he gives us he gives us these spiritual gifts for a reason and so we can operate in them and so we could resemble Christ on the earth. That's why in 2 Corinthians 3:18 it says that we we will be changed into the image of Christ from glory to glory. 
So I want to resemble Christ and not only how I treat other people in, in love, but I actually want to walk in power just like Jesus. Um, that's why in Luke uh, 2 or 3, I believe it says that after he fasted 40 days, he returned in the spirit with power. Um, so I want to walk in the spirit with power. So if someone says, I, I have love, I don't need gifts. This is totally unscriptural. And so the first thing, if I, if I heard this, if someone said this to me, it would, it would make me question the spiritual fruit that they actually believe they have. Because this is not biblical. Um, so turning to 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So it says, pursue love and spiritual gifts. So if you have love, you should be also pursuing spiritual gifts. Um, this kind of happens in the same order when I, um, and I still pursue spiritual gifts. I still pursue love. Um, but when I first got saved, one of the first things that I started pursuing very heavily was spiritual gifts. I kept asking the Lord day after day and um, the Lord started answering my prayers. I, start, I started being able to prophesy. I, be, I started being able to have words of knowledge, words of wisdom for people. I started being able to interpret dreams. So when we desire love and we pursue love, we will actually also receive spiritual gifts. Um, but it also means that we also have to ask for them. Say, Lord, I, I want to receive this gift. I want to operate in this gift so I can edify your church. But he says that you should also, that you also may prophesy. So, this is this prophesying gift is the one that benefits the church the most because you're edifying not only the person that you're prophesying over and it gives them faith and it gives like so when I'm struggling the first thing that I think of is heaven obviously reaching getting a glorified body but also getting or realizing or remembering this prop prophetical words that I've been spoke that have been spoken over me and um, the message that I got when I was first saved because I had a vision so I remember. I, um, I remember seeing what um, God showed me when I, um, not when I first got saved, but when um, I became reborn. So I remember those things. You remember prophetic words. And this is actually edifying to other people as well as not, as well as edifying to yourself. Um, and we're going to be talking about prophetic um, talk or not prophetic talking, but just being prophetic um, in a later video. But moving on, um, turning to Romans 5, 5 through 8. Thank you, Lord. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. So turning to Romans 5, 5 through 8, it says, and so this is the point that I have in love. So it says that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're asked, we're, the, the love of God was also completely poured out on us. And it says we are filled with the Spirit abundantly. It says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. So when we got the Holy Spirit, we actually got all of the love of God. But Paul says that we may abound in love. So you may not be the most loving person right now, but you are supposed to abound in love, get more and more loving, show more and more compassion towards other people. And this is what Christ has um, called us to be. It says that in Philippians 2, 1 through 8, it says that we should have the same mind. Um, it says in Mark 10, 45, it says that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And so it says in the verse before that, in verse 44, it says, if you want to be first, you must be a slave to all. And so that comes out of loving other people, wanting to serve other people, because you know that Christ is well satisfied with you when you do those things. But you also just want to do them because you love God. And when you love God, you also, um, without knowing it, you start loving other people because you're becoming like Jesus. And Jesus loves, like he says, no greater love has anyone than this to, than um than one, than one who lays his life down for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And he proved his love for us when he died on the cross. Um, so it says in verse 6 through 8, it says, For we, when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it says, also in Luke uh, 23, 34, it says, Jesus said, when people ridiculing him, it says, Lord, forgive them for they do not know what they do. That's the love we're supposed to have, um, have towards people. And when we act in that kind of love, we start op operating in this, this different power, this different spirit. This different spirit. Um, like Acts 19, Paul stuff where he's hanging, handing out handkerchiefs to people and demons are being casted out. He's doing unusual miracles, it says. I want to do those things. I want to heal the sick. It says that Peter was doing such great miracles that people were getting on their mattress just to be under his shadow, like that kind of power. And that power also comes from fasting. I mean, they're fasting constantly, but 
the point is, is that we're, we're supposed to operate in this love that um, in Romans 5, 5, it says that love of God has been poured out on us when we got the spirit. And so we're supposed to abide in that love. And that's how we operate um, even stronger in these gifts. When we ask the Lord to give us love for other people. Um, and it's not going to happen immediately. It says that one of the fruit of the spirit is love. It's something that grows. It, it continues to grow. And eventually you're going to start being able to see it. Um, love without gifts is often frustrating and empty. It's like being able to think but not being able to speak. You're, not, you're able to think but you're not actually able to act on what you're thinking. So love without spiritual gifts is, is empty. Because God designed it for us to love others and then help others spiritually. It's one of the reasons that God gave us the spirit. To walk in power. To walk in the power of Jesus. It says in Romans 8.11 it says we have the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead. So if I have the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead, then I, I ought to be walking in power. I ought to be doing healings. I ought to be doing miracles. I want to I wanna see the supernatural. I've lived in the natural too long. I want to see supernatural things. And so love will never lead a believer to refuse spiritual gifts. So if I, if so, if God, imagine Jesus walking up to you and he says, would you like the spiritual gift? And, if, and you claim to have love and you say no. No, the Holy Spirit is not going to lead you to deny. It says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench his gifts. Every single person has gifts. And some people have unique gifts. And uh, that's a whole different topic. Um, so my question to someone who claims that they have love, what are you going to do with that, all that love if you don't have the spiritual gifts to actually act on this love? Um. See, like the thing is, is that you can give food to someone who like has a broken leg or like has something wrong with their body. You can give food to them. You can say, I love them, but we have the power to actually heal that leg. We have the power to actually heal that ear. We have the power. I mean, it says that Jesus, it says that Simon actually cut off someone's ear and Jesus actually like grabbed his ear and put it back on his head. Like we have the power to do this. And so this is the kind of power that I will walk in. So what are you going to do with all that love? How are you going to help humanity in the church and the body of Christ and even outside the church? And Acts, they didn't really even have churches like we do today. They didn't have mega churches with the pastor's name on the building. <laughs> you need gifts for that. Imagine a mother sitting by her sick child and saying, honey, I love you, but I'm going to sit here. I'm not going to check your temperature. I'm not going to give you medicine. I'm not going to call a doctor. I'm not going to even pray for you, but I, I still love you. See, now that mother is actually neglecting her child she's saying she's saying i love you in word but indeed she's not actually showing that she loves anybody we have to be it says the kingdom of god is not in word but in power it says that in first corinthians four twenty, in power the kingdom of god is in power it says when we do deliverance it says the kingdom of god has surely come upon you the kingdom of god is in power not in word anyone can speak a word Or if we love the sick, we, we will desire the gifts that will enable us to minister to the sick, if we, which are the gifts of healing and miracles. Biblical love is very practical. It does not sit around and use nice phrases. It does something about it. See, when Paul, when Paul saw the, the, the lame man sitting in front of the temple, he, he said, gold and silver I do not have, but I, what I do have, I will give to you. And he said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus. And the man got up and started walking. That's a demonstration. That's a perfect demonstration of the power of miracles. We have the power to do so. And the church has been neglected of this, but the Holy Spirit is moving in a new way today and tomorrow and forever. It says that in Hebrews 13, it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So if you say that miracles are just for the book of Acts, it never says in the book of Acts that the miracles would ever stop. So they need to keep going. Something is changing the spirit. We must not be one-sided. We both, we need both gifts and love. We know we need both gifts and fruit. We need both spiritual gifts and ministry gifts. None of these things is a substitute for any of the others. We need all of them. We need to operate in all of them. When we need to exercise them, the same way that you exercise your body, you need to put yourself in a position where you're using them, where you're going out, where you're evangelizing to people, where you're talking to people, where you're actually going to church and a spirit-filled church, not one of those churches that has fake smoke and. Um, doesn't really preach the gospel. It says, 
It says the gospel is a two-edged sword. So if you're only getting fluff, then you're in the wrong church. I'm sorry. We need, to be, we need to be hearing about these things. We need to be hearing about generational curse. We need to be hearing about casting out demons. We've been so neglected, like the church is so hungry for this kind of power. That's why Jesus says, the man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Um, so that's all I really have. Um, next, we're going to be talking about where the gifts operate in the church. Um, how you get, well, how, how you know what spiritual gifts you have, um, if you even have spiritual gifts. Um, so yeah, um, hope y'all enjoyed and, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord.